Kia ora koutou, good day everybody. My name is Stuart Carr and uh, I'd like to start off by saying it's a huge honour to be here. To be invited to speak in the Rotary um, Wash Presentation Series. I'd like to um, start off by saying really that I'm not speaking here on my own behalf. I'm here representing a whole network of people. I'm a member of an End Poverty and Inequality Cluster based at Massey University, EPIC for short. But we have members all over the world and across a whole range of different disciplines and also working in a whole host of community settings, for example, with non-government organisations and social enterprises. So we have friends and partners around the world, and this talk is really um, it, on behalf of those, so I hope I do justice to the work that the groups and the network has been doing. I'd like to acknowledge also that we, ha I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the research we've been doing, and we've received funding uh, from a range of sources, as you can see there below, both in New, uh, in New Zealand and in South Africa, in fact, because some of our partners are in South Africa. Um, I'm here to talk about working poverty to living wages, so moving from working poverty to living wages, and not really taking a focus, uh, a focus on aid, aid itself, but really more at the idea of sustainable livelihoods, a more sustainable solution to uh, poverty and poverty reduction. And I'm going to ask, end by asking a question, really. The whole point of the talk is to see if there's any possibility of a partnership with rotary groups around the world uh, in this very, very important uh, domain. Our work in EPIC is uh, guided by a framework, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which as we know were introduced in 2016, will run for 15 years to 2030. Uh, they are uh, the grand plan for human development, arguably the most ambitious and integrated plan ever put together after several rounds of uh, global consultation, headed up by SDG 1, which is eradicating poverty and in all its forms everywhere not just in the so-called low-income countries, but in all countries and all economies. And in terms of every, uh, all, all its forms, poverty takes many forms, and these are all really poverties of opportunity. So poverties of opportunity and access to uh, decent nutrition when one is growing up, then access to uh, decent education, to schooling and so on as one is growing up, uh, going into uh, having access to a decent environment, uh, a clean and sustainable environment and heading into uh, decent work, access to decent work. And SDG 8 is really where a lot of our work has been focused on decent work and economic growth. And decent work here defined by the ILO is work that meets people's aspirations for decent quality of life and work life. And that may or may not have a link to economic growth and we're actually planning to look at that link between quality of life and working life and economic growth. This has the potential to feed into SDG 9, which talks about, for example, inclusive industrialization and then into reducing inequality SDG 10. So clearly it's an important goal. And uh, that's uh, what we've been doing, really, I think, is that the problem that the SDGs and the MDGs before them have run into and are running into is this idea that these are macro level goals. They are very grand plans and they, they've been sort of conceptualized at the macro level but they are goals that people have in everyday life you know to reduce their poverty to have access to decent education for their kids nutrition and access to decent work for themselves and their and their offspring and that chapat what marvelous chapat uh, um, uh, cartoon there on the bottom right is making the point that the translation of those macro goals into everyday life is really important it's quite a challenge also an opportunity and it's where if we now if we now look at the the gap you know what you know if we're talking about inclusion and versus exclusion and exclusion from opportunity where is the gap uh, well if we look at the number of people in the world who are classified by the world bank as uh, extremely poor this is living on less than one dollar 90 a day or its equivalent uh, there are over 700 million people in that situation living with an extreme uh, poverty that's a shocking enough statistic, but uh, even more shocking perhaps is that um, half of those uh, people in the world who are extremely poor are actually in jobs of one kind or another. So they are working, but they are also extremely poor. And that would seem to be a fundamental a contradiction in a way very indecent. If we look at the number of people in jobs around the world, uh, some three billion or so are in actually jobs of one kind or another. Um, half of those people in those the world's working population are classified by the World Bank as in jobs that are vulnerable, meaning in the informal sector, poorly regulated, often unsafe, uh, dangerous conditions, irregular work, 
um, insecure work uh, and very often uh, extremely uh, poorly paid. And in fact, uh, we can look at, you know, if we go beyond the people who are working, the 327 million who are working but living on less than $1.90 a day, there's a further billion uh, people who are earning between just $1.91 and $5, uh, not an hour, but in actual fact, a day. That's extremely shocking and begins to suggest that the idea of working poverty is possibly one of the major challenges that we are facing in the world today and opportunities to do something about it. Uh, minimum wage laws are a macro level idea. State intervention around laws, the safety net uh, laws to protect people's quality of life and job security and so on. Um, but they're, they're simply not working uh, around the world either because they don't reach those Millions of people working in the informal sector because they're not in a regulated market uh, or simply because they, they are woefully short of the uh, cost of living. And the cost of living has risen way beyond the minimum wages in many, many countries. And major reports, such as reports by Oxfam and so on, recently have been highlighting the gap between those, uh, those needs and those uh, and actual wages. This is a quick slide just to, to highlight the, the fact that against that backdrop of uh, minimum wages that don't meet basic living requirements, we've witnessed in the last few years um, a plethora of living wage campaigns around the world, whether it's, um, whether it's in the garment industry, the Asia floor wage campaign, which is a top left there, or in the fair trade ideas in and around, for example, the trading of coffee. We see a number of these organizations springing up around the world. Uh, the Oxfam report I mentioned earlier on the top right, top right there, highlighting that uh, the you know the gap between uh, actual minimum wages and the need that people's needs in real terms in the grape sector, bananas and tea uh, tea sector in agriculture, uh, a big gap between what people need and what they have in terms of their wages. And in the bottom right there, a reminder that these living wage campaigns are all unified i think under the idea that they're about uh, having a decent quality a, a wage that enables a decent quality of life uh, and work life and that's very much about decent work and people's aspirations and that's where uh, we'd like to focus uh, in our work and partnerships as we've just seen a, a number of living wage campaigns around the world and they're really driven i think by um labor movements what about organizational perspectives on living wages well there is some evidence around not a huge amount but some evidence around from an organizational level very often it's case study evidence so studies of actual organizations small to medium enterprises one or two larger companies and so on uh, it's showing that um, living wages if you pay the official living wage that can deliver efficiency so it can result in you know more productivity more staff retention and so on and there are some references there that are on the provided on the in full on the last slide. The problem with the case study evidence, though, um, it's clearly not been enough to persuade uh, and reassure many employers that, you know, if they did switch to a living wage, they would still stay in business. And we hear, for example, in New Zealand, quite a few uh, messages fear mongering, I think, um, uh, that if you do pay a living wage, you'll end up going broke because you're your wage bill will inflate too much and you won't recoup that investment in terms of um, profit and so on, productivity. Uh, in South Africa, one of our core partners, the focus is still on minimum wages. So uh, there is a, a, a living wage movement there, but it's, it's more of the energy is going into arguing to raise the minimum wage. Again, the same point, though, uh, it's, it's proving a struggle to get those wages up to uh, living wage levels. It's against that backdrop that we've come in with our focus, which I think would be called humanitarian work psychology. And this is really saying, well, why don't we adopt a, a human focus towards this, uh, try and find some middle ground and have some new diplomacies in there, um, which which will actually enable if we whatever research we do we'll have the diplomas diplomatic skills to take that research to the policy makers in other words to make the re research compelling in whatever it finds and persuasive so it's about becoming focusing on quality of human beings everyday lives working lives and everyday lives and bringing that to policy we have to realize i think or recognize that as we 
uh, start to research this topic, it's very often very heated, quite politicized, and it contains at least two major opposing ideologies. Now, these might be called, summarized as grow now, share later, versus uh, share now, grow later. And uh, just to quickly uh, summarize what those two approaches are, they're very much opposite, but they're trying to get to the same goal. So uh, the, on the uh, grow now, share later idea would be, or mantra would be, that what we have to do uh, is if we put wages up too high, we'll lose many jobs and that'll be counterproductive. What we have to do is be a low wage economy. If we keep wages really low, we'll get lots of efficiencies and uh, that will enable more prosperity to be uh, grown inside the company, the organization, for example. And then that will enable uh, firms and so on to invest in more jobs, create more jobs, we'll get more people in, and that eventually will float all boats. So job creation comes through keeping wages down. Eventually a lot more people get into work and then wages will, will actually slowly come up and that will enable more shared prosperity. Uh, the biggest argument against that is it simply hasn't happened for many people around the world. So since the last economic crisis, as economies have come back here in New Zealand, for example, people are feeling that they just haven't seen the wage rises and the job creation that they were expecting and had been led to expect under that sort of mantra. On the other side, we've got a, an, an, another ide ideology, another approach, if you like, another mantra saying, we know we need to be a living wage economy. We share now and then we'll grow, we'll grow later. So we take a, a gamble, really. We invest in people. Um, if we push wages too, down, too far down, we'll just get more and more poverty and stagnation. Austerity is not going to be productive in the longer run. So what we need to do is take a gamble, lift the wages higher to begin with, get them up to a decent living wage level. And in the passage of time, you'll get more engagement from people at work. This is like a business case, I guess, a hypothetical business case. Uh, people would stay and work longer. They'd be more, more loyal to the organization. They'd have more money in their pockets to spend, which would stimulate the economy. And all of that would go to stimulate jobs and share prosperity in through a completely different pathway. The problem with that approach is it just hasn't has not been convincingly demonstrated to many employers that it's worth uh, the gamble, and it's against that kind of a backdrop that we need to consider the research on the back. So it's against that kind of impasse I think that we've seen. We're starting to hear calls for some fresh approaches, and some of these are coming out of uh, my own discipline, which is work psychology. We've got people such as Bergman and Jean arguing that we need to focus a lot more attention on lower income workers, uh, figuring out ways to boost quality of work life and, and, and life there, enable that to happen, decent work to happen there. And Smith arguing that we uh, need to understand better why minimum wages are failing and what we can do about it to raise living standards through uh, more decent wages and different mechanisms. And when we look at how living wages themselves have been calculated, they've been cal calculated econometrically by and large uh, in terms of money and money alone. So you might, for example, have as we did here in New Zealand, you have the Treasury comes out with a est every so often with an estimated cost of living for a family of four over a two week period, the cost of a shopping basket and so on, uh, an average shopping basket. And into that mix, you can throw some assumptions about uh, once a week, there'll be a small family treat, or maybe a small holiday once a year. Uh, some, uh, you know, some cel family celebrations every now and again, little treats. You can calculate these and make assumptions and you can uh, get a number. You end up with a number for that two week period. Then you make some assumptions about the number of people who are actually working. Uh, so you might say, well, we'll assume on average a family of four, 1.5 full time incomes, one half time income looking after the two children. And then you know the number that you need to get to in terms of dollars every fortnight and you calculate the hourly rate. In this case, it would be for 60 hours, uh, one full time, one part time job, say somewhere around about 60 hours at uh, the rate per hour that you need to get to to reach that living wage uh, number. And that becomes your living wage figure and hourly rate. The problem with that is that at no point in the proceedings are people actually asked at all about their quality of life and their and as well their quality of work life. The human being has actually been stripped out of the process, which has almost become completely circular. 
And our approach in a way has been much more direct, uh, hasn't made any assumptions about family size, uh, although we've tried to control for those sorts of variables. It's just involved going saying, well, why don't we just actually go and ask people directly about their quality of life, about their quality of work life, their sense of inclusion and so on, and then look at how much money's coming in through the, the wage uh, at work for that person, but then also household income, and then map those monetary incomes into that decent, uh, those levels of quality of life and work life. And that way we may actually get towards estimating a living wage from people's actual experiences. Remember the Chapat cartoon there, uh, be able to chart its benefits for inclusion and possibly even start to show how those income levels not only link to quality of life and work life, but also to uh, workplace productivity and so on, which would be the start of a business. As Kurt Lewin once said, there's nothing as practical as a good theory. And we've been using applied theory to try and think about and theorize around uh, living wages and how they might actually play out in society and at work. On the left-hand side, we have a graph which shows, uh, which is borrowed from poverty trap theory. Now, poverty trap theory comes from economics, and it essentially says that uh, it's the blue-shaped line there, the S-shape or sigmoidal function. And poverty trap theory says that people... Um, on lower incomes will tend to stay trapped within those lower incomes. So, for example, because they have a lower, uh, uh, too low a wage, if someone gets sick, they have to borrow money, they may have to pay a, a money lender and pay a high rate of interest and, and then find themselves going backwards as a result of that. Or because their wages are low, they can't afford to pay bills, so they pay the penalty. Again, they go backwards and they can't afford to buy things in bulk and get cheaper prices, so they end up buying in smaller units and paying more and so on. Um, and, and what this theory is important because it's only beyond a certain point, a living wage, in other words, which is marked on the graph there, will people start to rise above the midpoint. Now, that personal thriving on the y-axis can either be money today versus money tomorrow. So you, you, your money tomorrow never quite match your income today until you reach a certain point. It starts to get higher tomorrow than it is today. Or it can be human capabilities like um, happiness at work, happiness in life, uh, life and satisfaction, respectfully, well-being, pride, a whole range of, of uh, life quality and quality of work life variables. And so poverty trap theory is saying, ah, yes, we have a we have to that point, otherwise people will never get out of poverty. King poverty will never be reversed. The problem for that uh, is minor blue is that there are a theory, which is a dotted line, and that's the law of diminishing returns or marginal returns, which suggests that uh, one candle in a darkened room is super bright compared to the same candle against 99 others in the same room. And one dollar in your pocket is much more meaningful than one when you haven't got any money at all than it is when you have 99 other dollars in your pocket. And the idea here is that any wage is a good wage and low wages are good wages too. Uh, this is a bit like the grow now, share later um, uh, mantra. And the, the, uh, the blue line there, I think the co continuous blue line is a bit more like uh, share now, grow later. Uh, which of these two is really important because it has huge implications for policy and we have to we don't actually know yet which one is because if this if the S shape is right we need to reach a living wage otherwise we'll never uh, get rid of working poverty. Uh, on the right hand side we have another theory from economics uh, which is efficiency gains theory which essentially says that only beyond a certain income will people exert maximum effort and the mechanism for that might be for example uh, the efficiency wage mechanism might be that they feel there's justice in their wage at which, pace they, at which point they will exert maximum effort. The interesting possibility here, and we're starting to talk about a business case at this end, those two S-shaped functions actually overlap so that a living wage is actually an efficiency wage. And again, that needs to be tested. This is just a quick summary of some um, some findings that we've made in New Zealand recently uh, with the Empower Unit, uh, Massey People Organisation Work and Research uh, at Massey University, and this has been recently in Labour and Industry. And it was called Waging Well. Uh, it was a pilot study, really, funded by the Vice Chancellor's Discretionary Fund at Massey. Just a quick summary: um, we the way we've done this research is very consultative, so. We've followed the idea of partnership in the UN SDGs, SDG 17, consulted with a whole range of stakeholder groups from unions and firms to labour uh, management, um, people in the community and so on. And we've, we've, we've discovered from that people say you can't 
put out massive big saves. People on uh, lower income whose, whose time is pressing and so on will not be ready or prepared to answer long-winded and overly academic questionnaires. So you're going to have to keep it relatively user-friendly. Um, we decided in the end with advice from those stakeholder groups to go for an online mobile assisted survey uh, which we put out through the unions, through the uh, firms and through uh, various uh, professional associations. Uh, we ended up with a sample of um, nearly 1,200 people reasonably spread throughout New Zealand. We ended up with a bias. We were hoping to actually uh, recruit quite a lot of participants in lower incomes and you can see there from some of the demographics that we really ended up with um, uh, rather more professional workers than we read uh, for the purposes of the work. Interestingly, a bias towards uh, to women, towards women rather than men, which is really interesting to speculate why we got that. Um, and incomes are a little bit higher than we thought. Um, the hourly rate was 26 foot per hour on average, which is slightly higher. The living wage at the time was 19, just over $19. Uh, but still, we ended up with quite a lot of people in those lower income ranges, uh, in lower income jobs. We had a whole range of measures from workplace empowerment through to job satisfaction, occupation, work in workplace there, and also around life satisfaction and well-being, both physical and mental, and participation in community life. And we used a whole range of these mobile assisted interactive um, uh, images there for the scaling to make the study interesting and uh, user friendly. Uh, here uh, are some uh, brief overview of the findings. Um, first of all, we found that we uh, we need to, to uh, measure both narrative and number. So we wanted to measure people's uh, life stories and also obviously because the living wage is a number, we wanted to have a dollar figure in. So we started with um, asking people, does your pay provide enough for your basic needs? Now, uh, and, we, and this is against household income. And what we found was we started to see more people saying yes than no to that question only once wages reached above the 30,000. So somewhere between 30,000 coming in uh, gross uh, annual domestic uh, annual um, household survey uh, things switched as we went from there into the 40,000s here's a little bit more of the narrative side of things um, vertex 2 in a sort of triangulation process a process we asked how well does your work wage your wage work for you and we can see here that in the 30,000s brackets uh, we start. We saw really more struggle stories than we did in the forty thousand. So somewhere between thirty thousand and forty thousand uh, um, annual salary, household gross. There's a shift in people's the quality, if you like, the qualitative experience in people's stories. And you can see on the left hand side they're having to juggle, struggling week to week, swimming along the surface, if you like, or just under the surface. And then into the 40,000s, people are starting to say have their narratives, their stories are starting to talk more about having a little bit to spare and the occasional luxury being enjoyed. So some quality. Okay, so here we have some, uh, some very much quantitative findings, uh, although they're focusing on the quality of life uh, in terms of uh, capabilities. On the right hand side, we have quality of work life and on the left hand side, quality of life in the broader sense in and around the inclusion, I guess, in society. Uh, these are on the x-axis of the graph, so we have household income brackets. Now we can see that the samples drop from around 1,200 to 630. That's because people don't always like to tell too much about their financial situation. And what we found is that household income bracket, although it's the best, it's the one that people most readily talk about, um, we still lose a few people. And that has various um, implications that I'll, I'll, I'll mention in a moment. But the, the main thing to notice here is that uh, when we look, when we plot the capability in terms of empowerment, justice, pride, satisfaction, for example, quality of work life, um, we can see a clear spot in the 40,000 household income per annum. Now, it's starting to suggest a bit more the sort of um, the poverty trap theory, perhaps the idea that there is a cusp that you need to get beyond before things actually start to improve noticeably um, on all of those variables. And that the gap is statistically significant. We've controlled statistically for the household size, the number of incomes, the nature of the work, full time, part time and so on. So these are adjusted means. Um, they're on single items, so that we have to be very careful here because uh, single items are not as reliable as multiple items. Although, between the groups which we're looking at here, between the salary brackets, uh, there they can be quite a good, fairly good estimate of where the true mean lies. So, on the right hand side, quite clear indications perhaps of some sort of living wage threshold being reached. The pivot range, as our colleagues in Empower have called it very nicely, I think. 
On the left hand side between 30,000 and 40,000 we see another steep climb at least on the top two graphs um, not so much on the bottom and there is a set, uh, an earlier climb happening uh, in the lower income brackets possibly around um, minimum wages we're not sure. So the picture a little less clear but still some significant hikes on at least two of those graphs um, between 30 and 40,000 household income per annum. Now we haven't actually included here our graphs, we have many more of these graphs um, in and around uh, workplace income. So we've looked at household income there, but because of the drop in sample size, we're having to develop multiple item measures that are more reliable for that particular variable. Those are under review with um, our peers, and as soon as they're uh, ready, we will release them. But for now, we just want to signal that we are, we do have more data than this, it's just a sample, and we're, we're sort of continuing to probe that question of is there a living wage, not only in, in terms of household income, but also in wage, uh, living, living wage at the actual uh, workplace. In terms of our learning points so far, we've, we, what we've found across all of these graphs, whether, only, not only the ones we've presented there, but others, that none of the linkages are linear. So we haven't got straight lines, we've got curves. And we seem to be finding that the, the best, the most closely associated capability uh, with money at work, whether it's money in terms of wages or household income, is in, a, in and around fairness. Quite a close association with perceived workplace fairness. So whatever wages are doing to people's thinking and feeling in and around the workplace and outside of work, fairness is fairly central. Um, the, the study so far, the sample we had, we've seen it was biased, so we, we still haven't got really right down to the lower end of those curves. In terms of income, we're struggling to do that, but we're, we're going to keep pushing on. Uh, and, you know, we, we, we uh, may have bias there towards the middle of the curve rather than the lower end. Uh, our work so far has been in a relatively high income economy in New Zealand, although our inequality index has slipped to the fifth most unequal in the OECD in the past few years, past few decades. Um, and in, we've seen that people had access to, in, to the internet and computers, mobile phones and so on. Um, we need to, and we have a society which still has relatively low income inequality despite the losses that we've had recently. Um, so we do need more data from lower income uh, settings uh, at that lower end of the curve. And from that reason, we're, we're moving on from Mark 1 towards Mark 2, which I'm going to... Okay, so now we come back to that opening question about working poverty to living wages and whether there's a role for some sort of research partnership with Rotary in your global networks and groups and organizations around the world and all the great work that um, Rotary does. Uh, project GLOW, Global Living Organizational Wage, is a new project. It's a, um, it's a big project. It's, what we're asking is actually using purchasing power parity, which is the World Bank's currency. You can take any currency in the world, as we know, and convert it to purchasing power parity or PPP. So it controls for things like inflation, and so on, so it puts all of our metrics onto the same scale. Is there a global living wage that enables people and organizations, so we're gonna have a business case in there as well as a human case, and communities that, that really depend on sustainable livelihoods to prosper and thrive. So what we're envisaging is a whole, an expansion of this project. We're going to apply the Paris principles of aid effectiveness, which I know Rotary is obviously uh, uses, which is uh, in and around alignment with stakeholders and their perceptions and values and aspirations of what this research needs to do. A multi-stakeholder approach, <clears throat> some ownership. This is, uh, whatever happens here will be owned by the communities and the, and the groups who lend us their data to process. Accountability, we will be accountable to all those stakeholders. Harmonize, we wish to work closely with partners around the world, make sure that we're not duplicating and other people's efforts and we're actually dovetailing with what other people are trying to do, including the SDGs and it's going to be data driven. So we're going to use both qualitative and quantitative data to hopefully help inform the debate around sustainable livelihood and tackling uh, working poverty. Um, um, what we envisage is that this project will be interdisciplinary. So based on partnership, that's why we'd like to work with Rotary, Rotary groups. Um, we envisage a, research, a series of hubs around the world. So these will be research driven uh, and they will involve teaching. So teaching will be informed by the research that they produce, whether that's in institutions or in training programs, no distinction made. 
and service as well. So we, we're doing this so that we can service needs in the community and in organizations and sectors across trade routes and so on. So multi-purpose hubs. Um, we've set up so far hubs in at least 25 countries. Uh, we have people with a huge range of talents have come on board with this project, a whole range of graduate students that want to get involved either in a volunteering role or doing thesis role. Or, and teachers as well as uh, and instructors and researchers. Uh, we envisage that the project will be intergenerational, so spanning at least 50 years, uh, so we'll outlive the SDGs, um, and we will be looking at the effects of living wages down the generation. So does it really lead, you know, if, if you get a living wage now, does it, does it create a, a sustainable um, older age, so pensions, for example, does that enable your kids to get through school? more readily and more successfully and produce prosperity not only within generations but across it at least 50 years. Uh, so we're looking for sustainability there. And we want to make this uh, less about countries and more about supply chains and, and uh, fair trade routes. So uh, we hope to build capacity around actual supply chains, like for, let's taste for example garment trading from South Asia into the United States. Um, you know, what are the implications of having a, of different wages along that supply chain, all the way from the workers in those local communities through to the uh, people working in the shops in the, that sell those goods and then the people, the communities that are sustained along that supply chain. And the idea is that when there are disputes about salary and, 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 and so on, that the, the capacity we have will be able to inform the discussion that takes place along those supply chains. We know that they are taking place. The ILO is brokering some of them. And, you know, whether it's in the garment industry or whatever, we hope we can add value there. And we're going to have as well, and we've already got some skilled volunteers, a diplomatic corps who will take the research message to the policy table, whether that's macro, meso in terms of organizational policies uh, or micro in terms of small scale enterprises. And and so far, we haven't got any funding for this project. Uh, we're hoping to start off with a crowdfunding model, but eventually we hope to build capacity uh, to sustain ourselves in um, uh, less crowd-dependent ways. So almost finally, this is a map of the project. Uh, you can see the blue flags there. It's an interactive map. It's in development. We have actually many more of those blue flags around the world. And you can, when it's actually working, it's not open to the public just yet. But you'll be able to, people will be able to click on those icons and see who are the people in the hubs, what are they working on, what have they done so far, what are the learning points, how do they feed in supply chains, and so on. Uh, and we're hoping that this interactive map will go public within the next few months. But so far, we've actually got more than 25 countries represented, many more than that because we have multiple hubs in different cities and along a whole range of different supply and trade routes. Finally, this is just a list of some readings that people might find uh, interesting background reading, including some of the publications from the network, but also some classic work that's been done in the field and uh, obviously policy documents from the ILO and the like, um, from Empower at Massey University and publications from EPIC and our colleagues in Geneva, in CSEND and so on. Anyhow, thank you for your time. Kia ora, kakite ano. Please do feel free to contact me, uh, s.c.car at Massey dot ac dot nz if you would like uh, if your rotary group would be interested at all in becoming uh, part of this uh, partnership and this friendship network